We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today. Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. In 1777, General George Washington wrote a letter to Nathaniel Hackett, a New York merchant, with an offer of $50 a month. That might not seem like much, but back then that's more than $1,000 compared to nowadays. And this was to spy for the Continental Army. And then also he'd give him another $500 to set up a spy network. Now this network would end up becoming one of the most famous networks in history, a spy ring ultimately helping America win the Revolutionary War. This spy ring was called the Culper Ring. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, Let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time to stop with the DeLorean. The date is July 4th, 1775. We're here to witness General George Washington giving his general orders and introducing himself to his new army. This is where it's important because he did this two days after he arrived at his new headquarters, the Vassal Craigie Longfellow House. The address is 105. Brattle Street in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Then a year later, we have, of course, the same date, July 4th, 1776, the Declaration of Independence. And in 1777, George Washington writes a letter that we talked about here in the opening of the uh, episode to Nathaniel Hackett, leading to what would be known as the Culper Ring, a spy ring, helping turn the tide of the war and ultimately making the United States of America. You think it's a coincidence that General Washington spent about a year and a half right outside of Boston and then 200 years later to the year, Bill Belichick gets his first coaching gig in the NFL with the Baltimore Colts? I think not. We all know this story. We know how it plays out. Belichick would wind up in New England. Well, they used to be called the Boston Patriots, right? With an homage to those very General Washington's troops. Then in 2007, we have Spygate. Which is where we bring in this week's guest, Kevin Bryant. He is an author that obsessed over the Spygate scandal. Culminating in this moment. Today, when this episode releases, episode 201 of the Football History Dude podcast is on July 13th of 2022. And it is also the official release date of Kevin's new book, Spies on the Sidelines, The High Stakes World of NFL Espionage. A book that, well, let's just say, looks at how NFL teams have used spying throughout the history of the league to try to get a little bit of a leg up on their competition. Kevin has a diverse background that made him a great candidate to write this book, which we'll get into that more in the interview. But before we get into this interview, i got to let you know, Kevin, in his infinite wisdom and graciousness, has offered to send a signed copy of this book, the one that releases today, to one Lucky Sports History Network fan. And if you want your chance to win a copy of this book, all you got to do is head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash spies. That's S-P-I-E-S, sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash spies. 
That's the dedicated page where you can learn more about Kevin Bryant, his book, and so much more over on the Sports History Network. But for now, let's get into the interview with Kevin Bryant. So I'm going through here and you reach out to me and the first thing I got to do is I'm looking at this contact and it's a uh, hey, I got this new book that's coming out. It's about the spies and the different things of the NFL. And I want you to, let's start off there. Let's give me an overview, elevator pitch, whatever you want on the book. Spies on the sidelines, the high stakes world of NFL espionage. Yeah, so the book is all about the techniques that NFL teams use to collect information on their opponents in order to try to gain a game day advantage. So the book goes through the entire history of the NFL, and it has anecdotes from each and every NFL team in there as well. So, okay, so this is not just a let's focus on one particular moment in, I mean, everybody here, you know, they hear Spy and they think of Spygate. This is actually encompassing more than just Spygate. Right. So that's probably the most common question I get um, about the book is, hey, is this just about the Patriots and Spygate? And yeah, what I want to assure your listeners out there is that it is much more than that. Like I said, this this book has it has stories from every single NFL team. This is something that everyone is doing to a certain degree. All teams collect on opponents. Now, some teams do that in a impermissible means, and some teams, such as the Patriots have done in the past, go into illicit techniques. But but everybody's doing it to an extent. Yeah, so that's actually one of the questions I wanted to ask you. So before we get into maybe the meat and potatoes and all that, can you somewhat, how for the, the listener, define permissible versus illicit? So that way when we're talking about it throughout the show. Absolutely. So when we're talking about permissible collection techniques, these are methods that are sanctioned by the NFL, by the NFL policies and guidelines. When we're talking about illicit techniques, these are measures that teams are using that go beyond that, that teams can be fined for, can lose draft picks for, and that are in violation of NFL rules and policies. So it's something that for the most part is going to be clearly defined, or is it one of those where there's we find through the book a lot of times there's this gray line of, well, did they cross it? Did they not cross it? That kind of thing. That's a really interesting question. So... At times, it's well-defined, and at times, it's extremely gray. And the NFL has a lot of wiggle room at times to define that. There are, there are certain things, such as, let's say, listening devices in the locker rooms. There are clear policies that the NFL has that, that you can use and um, that clearly define that, that that is not permissible, although it doesn't strictly say state listening devices, it will say recording devices, electronics, et cetera, et cetera. And the intent is very clear. There are other times, let's say something like elicitation. You know, one one person like calling up a member of another team and saying, hey Joe, how you doing? Hey, what you know, we're playing uh we're playing this Sunday. What's going on? What have you guys been doing? What have you been praying for? And he starts talking to his his friend, his buddy. It for the purpose of specifically trying to target and get some information that could be helpful. Um, there's nothing out there on the NFL. Um, and, and a lot of times it gets very, very gray, such as doing something like that or having a, a person trying to sneak into another team's practice um, and spy on them to see what's going on, what new plays are being implemented. Uh, there's not really a lot out there. So it, it a lot of what teams could be punished for falls under basically, um, you know, good sportsmanship type of rules that that the NFL has that that are kind of a catch all, but it leaves it up very much to the NFL to determine when they want to exercise um, the punishments associated with that, or if they just want to let it slide. And a lot of times throughout the history of the NFL, they've simply let it go. One of those things where letting it go in the interest of, well, it turned out a good product on the field, so why are we going to ruffle the feathers? Or was there other reasons in your mind? Or does that get into the book? So for the most part, it gets down to 
the NFL is a business and they want to promote a good image. So they have a, they have what's called the NFL security. This is a group of former FBI officials for the most part and law enforcement guys who are paid to make sure that the NFL runs smoothly. So they make sure things like uh, players and coaches aren't gambling on games. Uh, they also step in if there is any big overarching problems that they think could um, undermine the NFL. And so, but but the the bottom line with them is even more than trying to ensure that everything is fair, they want to keep everything quiet as much as possible uh, because they don't want bad publicity. I mean, no company does. The NFL is no different, right? So yeah, at times. Um, Teams simply have have received a slap on the hand uh, through, you know, backdoor channels. Hey, knock it off. That's enough of that. Um, and then sometimes the NFL is open about it. it. It all it all depends on what's being done. You know, the coaches and the owners' relationship with the current NFL commissioner. Um, there's a lot of wiggle room there. Yeah, I mean, you kind of hit it right there. It's like a like a business nowadays, and depending on the person's status or maybe like how much they have a good relationship with the ownership or whatever it may be, things may come down differently. And of course, like there's the favoritism, but before I get too far, I'm going to go back in time again. So you touched on the FBI guys in the book. Did you ever get into Burt Bell and the red phone and talking to, I forgot their nicknames to the different guys in the locker room about the betting scandals? No. So I did not get into betting in, in this book. Yeah, that was a decision I made simply because I felt it was outside of the scope of the book. I, I looked into it. I did a quite a bit of research and ultimately decided to leave that out. I mean, that makes sense because like the, the like you said, the purpose or the, the mission or whatever it is of the book is to focus on the competitive advantages that teams are trying to gain based on getting information permissibly or illicitly, whatever it may be, right? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so okay let's um i mean let, let's find a way to go here what, what before we get into the, some of this why you what inspired you to write the book and why do you think you're the right person to write this book at this time so i think like everybody else back in the day when spygate it just happened right we're all fascinated about it you know i mean everything we're googling on the internet spygate spygate can't get enough let's find the next article so I was that guy as well. You know, I probably spent two weeks doing that. And I probably want to, I want to step further. I wanted to know what else had gone on in the NFL's history that related to spying. So I started researching that as well. And I found some really interesting material just on the internet on that. And I was like, okay, well, there's some, there's some good stuff, but after probably two, three weeks, weeks of doing a Google search, I really ran out of material. And I said, okay, that's that's all that is really out there. So I hopped on Amazon and said, okay, well, I'm going to find some books about it and I'll read up on it. And lo and behold, there is, there's nothing but one book on Spygate by Brian O'Leary and that's it. And I was working on master's degrees in both intelligence studies and sports management at the time. And I have a bachelor's degree in history as well. And I thought, you know, I've been wanting to write a book for a very long time, but I've never been able to settle on a topic. And I love football. I've watched football, the NFL my whole life. I said, this, this could be my chance. Uh, given that I have a background as, as a special agent, um, I've collected and protected information for the Department of Defense for over 20 years. I thought, this is it. This is, this is, this is what I want to do. So I spent eight years researching, interviewing and writing. Uh, it was, it was a long, very long process. Uh, but, uh, but a lot of fun too. Wow. Eight years. Like, so yeah, I guess so ever since that, I mean, you have like all these different pieces, these little ingredients of like being the special agent, NFL fan, the history bachelor's the information, I mean, everything that kind of comes together. So I could see why you thought this is the book. I got to write it. This is my lane. Uh, are you just interested in espionage in general, or is it just history 
Like, is it a specialization there you're focused on? Yeah, I really enjoy both. I mean, being a history major, you know, I've always read a lot of history books. So I found that fascinating. Um, Obviously, doing my master's degree in intelligence studies, um, spent a lot of time researching and reading on that as well. Did a ton of, uh, read a ton of intelligence books, related books, uh, when it came to writing the thesis. So yeah, I've spent a lot of time reading on both of those subjects. So, you know, when it came to adding in football, I was just like, oh man, this is like, I get to, I get to read history, you know, trying to research for spying and read on the NFL at the same time. This is like combining everything I love all together. So I was, I was, I was really excited about it and really enjoyed the process. Yeah, it's kind of it's almost somewhat of a genesis for this show too. Not nearly as in depth, and I don't have a breadth of knowledge like you do as far as like say history and and everything else. But I I was gonna go with fantasy football for a podcast back when I after I finished my degree. But then I was like, ah, there's so many podcasts out there for fantasy football. Am I gonna break through? And then I was like, I really like history. I, do you listen to Hardcore History by chance by with Dan Carlin, or have you not listened to that before? No, to be honest, I haven't. Uh, I've been so busy working on this book that I've had oh, okay. very so little time for much now else. Now that the book's going to come in, you can. I, it's okay if you pause this right now, go listen to it, because like hands down, by far, one of the great storytellers of our time when it comes to history, primarily military history, right on his thing right now, there's like the, the first step. But he only has so many of them, they're always free, but it literally takes this dude, similar to you, eight years. He puts out an episode, maybe eight to nine months in the making, but it's going to be a five hour episode that you're just going to sit there. And so when I started this show and I thought of driveway moment, a driveway moment is like where you just, you park, you drive, I'm back home, I'm in driveway, I'm sitting in the driveway for a while. And like 15 minutes go by. Oh man, that's like, that is a show for you to listen to. But besides the point, the reason why I bring that up too is because today is, I put that out there as a FHD vault episode. He's a huge football fan too. Okay. So you're a, 20th century history major i mean how often do you think that or maybe i should rephrase that what are some of the pivotal moments in american history that maybe helped catapult the nfl from one level to the next or even took it back mm-hmm. obviously you got you've got first you got to start off with the formation of the nfl you know, uh, which wasn't called the NFL back then, but it took a couple years for the name change. But uh, yeah, I mean, you've got the you've got the meeting there with uh, George Hallis, kind of setting everything up. I think um, the combining the AFL, the American Football League, uh, with the NFL. You know, when you when you inserted all those those new teams and owners and coaches like Al Davis uh, into the NFL. I mean, what would the NFL be without Al Davis? I mean, it's crazy to even think about. Um, huge. Um, you know, you've got like Paul Brown. I mean, talk about an instrumental guy with everything he did for the NFL. I mean, that guy was really the in- innovator of, of just about everything, um, you know, um, introducing headsets into the NFL. Talk about a big change. I mean, so for my book, when you're talking about spying on other teams, you know, that's what really makes it football so different from all other sports and why spying comes so much into play for football. It's all those little brief pauses that you've got in the game that allow coaches to come in and to be able to tell their players exactly what to do. I mean, plays are scripted like a play, more or less, right? So without headsets, all of those play calls were so much more vulnerable to being intercepted and for other teams to try to take advantage of that information if they could decipher what those what those calls were. And headsets eliminated a good deal of that to a certain degree. It's still out there. There's still audibles that are called. Um there's headset tampering. There's all, all types of stuff that do or possibly go on. So you mentioned that's a, um, may, maybe this is no relevance whatsoever and I'm making something up. The World War II era, let's go back to that. And they, 
you know, we're, that's one reason the so NFL, of course, after we get an influx of all these players coming back, did you ever find where there were the code breakers from the war? They come back and now they're like trying to decipher the codes. Is there any re- <laughs> um, moments of that? Yes and no. So. Yeah, so there are absolutely guys dedicated to trying to break um, code, both in college, college level, um, and the NFL, especially when you're talking about uh, audibles that are done by hand signals, right? Because that's the big thing that's left today in the NFL after we've gone, after the NFL's gone to headset use. So, yeah, some of the best minds in, in football are absolutely week in and week out trying to break the other team's codes of those signals that goes on nonstop. Um, and teams are always adjusting. So, the, you know, guys may dedicate 80 hours trying to break these codes and, and he does it, or he finds at least a few signals that he's like, Hey, I know what this is. I'm positive, but the other team may change it and they go into the game thinking they're good. And then it's not, it's all for nothing. But that's that's life in the NFL. Teams spend endless hours looking for every tiny advantage they can get, sometimes just to find it's not there at all. Yeah, it's funny because uh, really on the field, the, the athletes aren't that much different for the most part. And yeah, those little things can... Uh, Super Bowl three, for instance, uh, Bob Letterer was on here talking about how uh, we Bubank, the he was the coach of the Colts and... You know, blah, 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 blah. So any rate, he, he mentioned how that was basically what it was. He realized they were still, they were so cocky, the Colts, that they were using the same signals or something along those lines. And he said, here, watch this. And he did something. Yep, sure enough, he ran to the right. And they're like, and from there, they just knew what they were going to do. Yeah, good old Weeb Eubank. I, uh, I, I talk about him quite a bit in the book. He is, he is one of the, you know, one of the things I noticed in the book is, you know, all teams use some of the measures. Uh, there are some coaches throughout the history who have used a whole bunch of them, including the illicit techniques. And uh, they, they've, they've given the NFL a lot of personality. And, and we Bubank was one of those guys, you know, along with Al Davis and Bill Belichick um, that really have, they've, they've taken it to the limit. And, uh, you know, with, Growing up during my time when Al Davis was a big coach, I was like, oh, man, that Al Davis, you know, nobody likes this guy, you know, unless you're a Raiders fan, of course. Right. But I'll tell you, after doing the reading and the research for the book, man, you come around, you you come away with a whole brand new level of respect for these guys because they want to win so bad that they're just they're working nonstop. It's not just that they're willing to stretch the limits. They're doing that. They're working that hard with everything. And it's it's tough not to respect somebody who's willing to work 100 hour plus weeks around the clock to try to to try to win. And uh, and, and, and of course, you know, as the, for a reader, it just comes away with a lot of great stories of what these guys are up to and what they're trying to do. Yeah, I got to imagine you. So when you used earlier, you mentioned eight years in the making with interviews. Are we talking like former coaches giving away some of their trade secrets or like, hey, reliving some moments or is this like all hush hush still? Yeah, so I'm working on a book to a similar topic, but in college, college football. Right. And I've had a lot more success now breaking into the coaching ranks. Uh because of already being a published author. So for the first book, um, and because it was on the NFL, which is a little more sensitive of a topic than a lot of the college football, um, I didn't have as much luck getting into the coaching ranks, etc. A lot of the interviews that I conducted um, were done anonymously. People who did talk didn't want to talk and worry about what the NFL or their head coach or whoever else was going to, was going to say uh, about the matter. Makes perfect sense. You get an anonymous source, or you get a tip, even in any other kind of espionage, for instance, because you know they uh, what do they call it? Informant, right? Is that what the, the term would be? Right, an informant, a source, an agent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I mean, I, I get that, and I, you know, hopefully uh, 
uh, when you get the the book from the college, you get even some more fir- first hand sources or for whatever it's called. Uh, help me out here. What's it called? Yeah, I mean that's exactly what it is. It's a, it's a first hand source of information. So, um, but yeah, I've had a, I've had a ton of fun interviewing these guys. So many guys with so much so much history, so many great stories to tell. Um, it's really great getting to know all these all these figures around, you know, most guys that they worked in college or that have worked in the NFL, they worked in college too. So, um, you know, I interview one about, after I interview someone about NFL, we end up talking about college and vice versa. So keep it anonymous, of course, is fine. Uh, give me like, what's a story that I don't know, blew your socks away. You're like, Whoa, I didn't expect you to tell me that story. That's in the book, of course. You know, the most incredible story that I have in the book, I think, um, was an allegation. Uh, well, it's an alleged incident. I, I can't confirm for a fact that it did that it did take place. So it was in 1967. So the Rams under head coach George Allen uh, allegedly had a dwarf pushed in a stroller by a woman who was obviously, you know, pretending to be his mom, um, while the dwarf filmed footage of a Colts practice in Hollywood. Wow, and we're talking in the 60s. That must have been, it wasn't like they had little camcorder phones or nothing like that. Right. Um, so, <laughs> you know, and I don't, you know, is it, is it real? Is it not? Um, I don't know. But what I will tell you is that what I've, what I've saw through the research, uh, throughout the book is that that's just how far teams are willing to go. I mean, they're, they're creative. You've got to be creative because let's face it, you know, if you're doing something ordinary, you know, you, 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 take a regular, you know, guy in a suit and tie and out there and he's holding the camera up and taking photos of a practice, right? I mean, he's done, right? You're going to have your, you know, team securities out there. He's identified. He's, he's kicked out of there. You know, cameras probably, or at least the film's confiscated. So teams got to get creative on how they go about it. And they are willing to absolutely do anything. We, you know, there was an interesting one, uh, Sid Gilman back when he was coaching the Chargers before the 63 AFL championship game, right? So he says, he says to the coach of the other team, um, who is Mike Holovac of the Patriots, hey, why don't you come down to San Diego? I'll arrange everything for your practices. You're going to do your practices on a Navy base here in San Diego, Okay. So Olivac's like, oh, great. That's wonderful. Thanks. You're a great guy. What Sid Gilman does is he inserts two of his coaches into the ranks of the Marines who are there to help them, the Patriots, during their practices. You know, and as a result, of course, the Chargers know everything that the Patriots are about to do. Um, they, they blow through the game. I mean, it's a complete blowout. Uh, Chargers scored 51 points and the Patriots couldn't do anything right. Uh, the only thing that worked was when quarterback Babe Frilly drew a play in the dirt, a brand new play that had never been practiced. And they just, they just winged it and it worked and went for a touchdown. And that was their only score of the game, you know? And I think that just shows, you know, just, just how creative a lot of these teams are when they're when they're coming up with ideas of hey how can we fleece the other team how can we pull one over and get the advantage did you ever find one where a team knew like they were on to the scent they knew they were being spied on so they purposely gave wrong signals or something like that yeah absolutely and as a matter of fact what teams will often do uh one of the chapters on my book is about stealing paperwork so teams will quite frequently try to, um, you know, they'll go into a, another team's locker room, especially if it's the visiting team's locker room. The home team will, after they leave, go in there and try to rifle through stuff and see, hey, do, can we find anything? Um, hotel rooms 
or a place that can be constantly searched, conference rooms, dumpsters outside of team headquarters and facilities. All these places are places that have been or can be targeted. So, you know, when you're talking about a locker room, what, what I've heard frequently both at the NFL and college level is that teams will specifically try to leave behind information. Obviously, fake information, okay, to try to fool the other team into thinking that they know what's going to come. So I know at the college level, there's, uh, it's, it's been hugely successful. Certain instances of it. Um, absolutely. So what you do is you don't, you don't just put in a bunch of garbage in there. It's not just like a bunch of random stuff that's not, has nothing that isn't close to the truth, right? They try to sucker the other team into believing it. So they'll call plays that are very similar to the rest of their play names, uh, to the play calls, and they're going to try to set it up so that if they can make the other team think that on a third and one, they're going to run a, you know, a zone sweep. They'll make it, they'll, they'll design a play or put into the fake play sheet a play that is just like, that looks like that before the snap of the ball. When in, in reality, it's a fake handoff and then a pass. And if the defense thinks they know what's coming and they think they know where the ball is going to be ran, and they bring up that whole secondary to defend against it. Well, if you run a pass play off of that, you're toast. That thing could go for a touchdown easy. And so, yeah, teams are teams are very much involved in 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 trying to trying to trying to do that, trying to pull off those types of uh, off the field victories. Yeah, I could imagine. Like, yeah, once you're pot committed to going after that ball carrier, especially if like there's no reaction, it's like I know I'm going because that's what coach told me to do. I mean, there's no reaction time to recover and get that that pass. Yeah, when when, when teams think they know what's about to happen, can be when they are most vulnerable. And so one of the one of the chapters I have on my in the book is um, on debriefs. So when players or coaches change teams. They are frequently debriefed by the other team to, you know, they want to know, the other team wants to know, hey, tell me all about your old team. What do these signals mean? What is this quarterback? What are his weaknesses? What does he not like to face? They're, they're play, you know, they're going to push a bunch of questions onto him trying to get that game day advantage. When, when players from another team, right, they switch teams, they play their, the team that they had first played for right? They're, they're, they're going against them. That's the opponent. Well, when they think they may see a signal and think, hey, I know what this means. I know what this audible hand signal means or the audible that the quarterback shouting out. I know what's about to come. And so that player is going to try to tell everybody else on his team, hey, this is what is about to happen. Well, you know, coaches are taking all that type of stuff into consideration before the game on both sides of the field. And the other team may go, you know what? Number 82 on the on the defense, he used to play for us. He knows he knows what our what this signal is. Why don't we change it up? Instead of this signal meaning this, let's change it from a run to a pass or whatever. And so, yeah, players, players switching teams can sometimes be a liability to a smart team that's willing to plan uh, for what the other team should, should be anticipating. Yeah, I could, so, okay, this is another thing that just popped in my head. You ever hear of any, through your research, like almost like double agents where the coach specifically said, okay, we're going to ship you off to this team and you're going to come back in two years, but this whole time you're collecting intel or whatever it may be. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting topic. So, first of all, my my personal belief, and I will just say this is this is personal belief. But what I know about, you know, through through having a intelligence studies degree and all of that, I would be shocked if at some point in NFL history. Uh, you know, teams did not have a spy working in the organization of another team. 
Having said that, what I found through most of the research that I conducted was that most of the time when that takes place, it is when a member of a team is changing organizations. They will transfer, you know, they'll say, hey, I'm about to, you know, I'm about to leave this organization. The other team will say, hey, uh, you know a bunch about the draft for the team you're leaving. How about you share, you know, what you, what you know with us, even if that coach hasn't yet yet officially departed. And so that type of stuff has 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 gone on. And we talked about Weave Eubank earlier. Um, that was that was something that uh, that had that that he was uh, accused of doing. Yeah, absolutely. It goes on. I think it goes on a lot more than people would would realize even in the NFL I I would be I would be shocked if if teams don't insert uh moles or you know um inside of other organizations um of course you know you've got to be careful I mean that could have huge ramifications for what the NFL was willing to do in in, in punishing a team so I would imagine if that is that it's much more likely that is something of, that happened in the past where teams would try to insert a, a, a mole into another team's organization. Uh, the NFL was a little looser back then. There was definitely um, a, li- a lot more illicit collection techniques being being done uh, than there are, are today for the most part. Um, but I would, I would absolutely never, ever rule that out. I, I think that is a very real possibility. And teams are very, very concerned about that. That is something they absolutely take countermeasures on a constant basis uh, to try to um, to try to deal with. I mean, teams realize that 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 could happen, and they a lot of them assume, okay, this could be going on, and how do we limit the information that could be given that another team could take from having a a mole inside of this organization. And teams absolutely deal with that, and that that can be everything from, um, well, I know under the under the Kansas City Chiefs, I think it was like ten years back, um, they used to have security guys come by and close all the all the all the shutters or the the blinds to all of the office windows overlooking the practice field, because they didn't want employees being able to watch practices. Because they were worried about what could be reported back to another team if there was a spy in the organization. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned uh, how I bet it was more of a wild west. I mean, we, you you mentioned George Hallis earlier, and I know Joe Ziemba on One Football with Football shameless plug here. He's mentioned many times the stories of like different kinds of uh, spy or maybe accusatory spy heck <laughs> type of situations, and even. Uh, Oh geez, I can't think of the, the the particular coach that they were talking about, but it was a rivalry. And yeah, there was. Some, I mean, do you have any old school stories to bring up before we get into some other things? Well, there's so many instances, especially back in the day before practice fields were well secured. So one of the things I do for the book is not only talk about all of the spying techniques that are done, but Also, what are the countermeasures that teams employ? So when you're talking about like spying on practices, um, for a long time, practices were just held out on on fields, in parks, wherever the team could figure out the whole of practice, right? And so teams were doing things like parking the car on, on the side of the road by these practice facilities. And watching what was going on, sometimes flying out and have, paying for a guy to stay at a hotel to go and to watch these practices. And then, you know, and at times they'd be caught. You know, there'd be security members writing down license plate numbers of suspicious vehicles and then go into the police department and going, hey, uh, does this, what is this license plate? Who does this correspond to? You know, oh, it's this rental company. Oh, okay. Now let's go talk to the rental company. You know, and they're like, oh, yeah, that vehicle was rented out to so-and-so. And then they'd match the name up. Oh, that that guy, hey, he works for this team. What? It, you know, and, and and so teams would absolutely, they'd, they'd be able to piece the, um, 
put together the pieces of the puzzle there. And that was extremely common before there were fences, um, which really, I mean, you're talking, it depends on the team. You're talking anywhere from the 1910s and 20s when those went into effect all the way up to, man, that was problematic for some teams all the way to the 60s and the 70s. And it's still problematic for some teams today. How do you protect? How do you protect against high rises? High rise buildings. When you're, let's say the New York Giants, if you're practicing outside, you know, I mean, there's, there's literally thousands of people that can watch. You know, in some of these hundreds of thousands of people that can watch in some of these uh, practice facilities for some teams, which is why teams more and more move into indoor facilities. And I know everyone probably thinks that's weather related. Oh, teams want to be able to practice when it's rainy or snowy or blah, blah, blah. Nah, it, it's it's so much more than that. You know, uh, facilities have been built really largely because of that issue of, hey, we know we can't secure our practices and we know that other teams are paying to rent a hotel room. That is, you know, and get in a room that's 10 stories up just so that they can sit there and watch or record practices. And and that goes on. And, you know, teams have, teams have rented out entire sections of hotels on practice days to try to ensure that other team spies can't even have access to it. So... It's absolutely wild, all this stuff and what all goes on. And, and, and just, you know, not just the spying techniques that teams are willing to use, but how far teams are willing to go to try to protect all of their information as well. Yeah, and again, before we get, so you said this book is filled, obviously wild. Uh, let's just remind the listener of the show right now. So this book, if you're listening to this episode, that means it's already released July 13th of 2022. And if you're listening in the future, head on to Amazon or even head right to the sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash spies, and you'll be able to be headed right over there. You'll get more show notes as well as a link to the book. And then we're going to go ahead and let Kevin say one more time. What's the name of this book again? Spies on the Sidelines, the High Stakes World of NFL Espionage. Okay, so Spies on the Sidelines. Low down. Seriously, let's give it a percentage. You just wildly pick it out of the sky. How much do you think that spying, whether it's permissible or illicit, actually plays an impact on the outcome of a game? Yeah, it's a good question. I would say you're probably talking roughly on average. I would say. Five to ten percent per game, uh, but you know you're talking about things like advanced scouting as well. So watching film of another team and studying what their tendencies are. Hey, what do they typically do on third and one? So that's that's part of it as well, and that's that's huge. And to say that's only you know makes up if you didn't know if you didn't study the other team, how much are you going to know about it? So that could be much more than ten percent. So I would say this, sometimes knowing what the other team is going to do has absolutely zero impact. If you are a much better team than your opponent, you're going to steamroll them whether or not the other team knows what you're about to do. Doesn't matter. Um, however, if you are roughly, roughly, you know, equal, um, and the NFL is built on parity these days, right? So most most NFL teams are pretty even. Man, it can be it can it can absolutely 110% make that difference of what is needed. Um and sometimes knowing what the other team is going to do, there are some examples out there and I have it in the book because that's one of the questions I wanted to answer was does it really matter? Um and I got into that with on the chapter on signals collection. How much of an impact does it make when the other team knows the signals and know what's going to happen? And there's one story in there about, hey, here's a team. They play, right? They're, they're rivals. Okay. They're in the same division. Play twice a year. Game one, extremely close. Game two, I think the score was 61 to seven. Um, and the team that had lost, I'm pretty sure that lost the first game, won the second one. So it just goes to show you when you, you know, if you know everything the other team's going to do and you're, it can make it can make a make two very even teams look extremely lopsided, just like that. 
Um, but it depends. But it's certainly an advantage, and I think just like in warfare, you know, it's 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 a we call it a force multiplier in military terms. It's not necessarily going to win a war, but it can give you that advantage of, you know, instead of having you may have you know two thousand troops on the ground there, but when you have that additional information, it's as if you have three thousand or four thousand because it allows you to do things. Um, that you otherwise could not and to take advantage of situations that you otherwise would not be able to. Yeah, that makes sense. And, it, and this is what popped in my head. Um, I think uh, Pete Carroll must have been spying because when you say that the, 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 so the, the Seahawks and the Patriots, like, okay, I don't care how much a spying knows. You give the dang ball the beast mode, he's not going to be stopped at the goal line. Like, he must have got, <laughs> got too cute because he was spying on the Patriots, trying to give them pill of their own medicine or something like that. So here, here's another DeLorean question for you. All right, we're going to pop this back up here. This time it actually is going to be NFL-related. This is the one I was going to ask you earlier. You can go back to any point in NFL history that you – research revolving around spying where the details maybe were a little bit murky that you want to know actually what really happened. Well, I'd be pretty tempted to go with the, uh, the dwarf one I talked about earlier. I think that's, 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 that's gotta be one of the great ones in, uh, in NFL history. Um, you know, there's a lot of things dealing with the Patriots that I would, I would love to know. Um, I know a lot of them have their suspicions of headset tampering that have, that have gone on, uh, for, for quite some times, which is more or less, you know, a, a, the opponent's headsets going out, uh, especially when playing in New England. Um, and I talk about that in my book and there's a lot, there's some people that say, and there's experts that say, no, that's not possible. And there's experts that say, absolutely. It's a hundred percent possible. I, I would love to have been at some of those games where other teams suffered some of those uh, he headset uh, issues and uh, to see what really what what what, you know, may or may not have happened, uh, gone on behind the behind the scenes there. Or, you know, there was also accusations of uh, of the Patriots stealing play sheets from out of locker rooms of opponents. Um I mean, and, and you know, those are those are basically scripts for what's going to happen for the first, you know, ten to fifteen play calls of of a game. And so, you know, you want to talk about advantage. You know, did it happen or not? I don't know. I, just, you know, it's it's interesting. There's so many great periods there. So many stories that I'd love to know. You know, all the things behind the scenes. And unfortunately, a lot of the people that uh, you know been involved in in a lot of this stuff throughout the history of the NFL. Um, you know, no, no longer, no longer around to be able to share all of their stories, uh, unfortunately. But, um, but yeah, I think, you know, it's, you know, the subject more than anything, it's just a, it's kind of a fresh take on the NFL, a fresh look. And I, I don't mean to, you know, um, condemn any team, you know, it, the Patriots, the Patriots get a lot of, they get a lot of flack, you know, in Belichick. Um, it's not really the point of the book. I, I love the NFL and I think this is a fun new take and look on it. Um, you know, I'll leave it to other people to decide what's cheating, what's not cheating. Honestly, to me, it's just a fascinating topic and it's a lot of fun. And, um, you know, having done investigations in the past, I love trying to put pieces of the puzzle together. But really, I, I don't want people to come in and take it and be like, oh, I knew it. This is, see, I told you this, you know, this team's doing this, our rivals are doing this. It's not what the, it's not, it's really not what I tried to make the book about. I tried to just paint it as, you know what? This is a bunch of fun stuff. The NFL is entertainment. It's not worth getting all riled up about, in my opinion. You know, let's have a good time. Let's enjoy it. Let's get some new stories in there and talk about some stuff that's going on and just, and just have fun with it. Yeah. I mean, invariably, that's uh, the first thing that came in my head, too, is, oh, this is an I got your book. But then, I was, then as you're talking about it, able to do more research, it's, it's the history and some cool stories and things like that. So, you know, again, the listener of the show, the, I hope that you took this interview and you're able to uh, get inspired to go grab the book, which, again, what is the name of this book, Kevin? Spies on the Sidelines, The High Stakes World of NFL Espionage. And other than finding it on Amazon, is there like a website or anything that maybe the person, the listener of the show can find you at? 
Absolutely. So my personal, uh, the book's website is www.spiesonthesidelines.com. And that will have everything about about me. It's got about the book. It's got all my uh, social media um, contact information. And it'll have everything on how, how to purchase the book. It's going to be coming out on in hardback. I'll have a e, uh, e-book as well and also a audio book. Perfect. And then, so the last question I always ask is the last words of wisdom of the show. So I want you to give last words of wisdom, advice, whatever it is to listen to the show, but through the lens of spies on the sidelines. Some advice. Well, I would just say, you know, find out, figure out ways to make the NFL fun. I, I think for, you know, that's a challenge for, for some, for some fans for some fans of certain teams, right? I mean, your team has a bad decade. I mean, what are you going to do? And and some people, they live and they breathe football, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if you're that person that your whole week, whether it's a good week or a bad week, depends on whether or not your team wins. I would just say, you know, let's let's find some ways to make it, to make it fun nonstop and enjoy it. And, uh, and that's, that's, you know, that's what I've tried to make the book. Just, just something fun, and uh, it's there for entertainment. Um, so let's let's take it for what it's worth. And I, you know, I'm a hardcore fan too. Uh, and when my team loses, it's it's rough. I, I know, but uh, but you know, there's there's a lot more important things in life, and, and football is just it's it's there for entertainment. There you go. Just enjoy watching your team, and while you're watching your team. I wonder if you're going to go ahead and start looking at the coaches on the sidelines, looking at the guys in the stands, looking for spies. But either way, all I know is you got to watch the game and just enjoy it. If you like this episode, you can get in touch with Kevin or any of our guests or podcasters on the network by heading to the contact page on the sportshistorynetwork.com. We'll make sure that that message gets right over to him so he can respond as soon as a lickety split. While you're on the site, Make sure you click on that button, head on over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash spies. That's S P I E S, sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash spies for your chance for a free autographed copy of Kevin's book, Spies on the Sidelines, the high stakes world of NFL espionage. And while you're there, you can learn more about Kevin and all of our other great content on the Sports History Network. And now that we learned a little bit about spying in the NFL, Next time, uh, we're going to transition to a person participating in some of these tactics in the real world, Ken McGee. Ken is a former DEA agent, and he owns possibly the biggest, grandest, wildest collection of University of Michigan football memorabilia in the known universe. And some of these include a copy of most of the programs and ticket stubs in U of M football history. Between these programs and ticket stubs and others across the nation, Ken is about to release a book with a fellow author, Brian Snyder, titled The Ultimate Michigan Football Program and Ticket Guide. That's going to come out in mid-August. Now, this is going to be another very cool story for you to hear. So you got to make sure that you don't miss it, right? You want to get it as soon as it releases. Well, all you got to do is stay tuned to this channel. And the best way to stay tuned to this channel is make sure you subscribe or follow it for free that we're going to get a notification as soon as that episode comes out. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. Put up my replica 1909 World Series program poster from Row One Brand. And that's all it took for Marla to do a complete redesign of the Guardian offices, doing up the walls with tremendous prints from baseball, football, basketball, hockey, and more sports events. And every one of them can't help but trigger memories of sports yesteryear. And here's the last one. Let's put it up here by your desk. 
perfect. Oh, that's a nice one. College football, 1923, Navy versus Penn State. Do you remember that game, Marla? I sure do. It was October 20th, 1923. Cloudy, but a reasonable 57 degrees at the 2.30 kickoff time. Over 20,000 turned out at Beaver Field in College Station, Pennsylvania for this clash of two of the nation's top teams. The Nittany Lions were the underdogs, despite having won their first three games by a combined score of 94 to nothing. The heavy favorites were the midshipmen, who went on to play in the Rose Bowl after the season. Right, and the game immediately became... The entire color of the game would ultimately be dominated by Penn State's star halfback, Harry Wilson. But both offenses took some time to get going for a good 22 minutes before Wilson got the crowd to their feet with an interception of Bill McKee's forward pass, returning it all the way for his first touchdown of the day. Wilson certainly was great On the next kickoff, who would end up as returner but Harry Wilson? Wilson dodged at least a half dozen. Recall the greatest moments in sports history or just your own personal favorites with Row 1 Brand Sports Paraphernalia. Don't delay. Visit today at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full Row 1 catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, Telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act A for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan. Sports Right. Coming soon. Name Penn State 14-0. The second half had barely begun when Harry Wilson and Penn State went on to work on Navy again.